All right, last couple of messages we had uh, last week, Scott gave a message on what total surrender, I believe it was, and then the week before, uh, Nathan shared, and he gave us a message uh, on obedience, so we kind of seem to have this theme that seems to be going on, and when uh, Nathan was talking, he, he was making some references to uh, David, and so this kind of got my piqued my attention, and so I'm kind of coming at this in a backhanded way on that same theme, and so it's a man after God's own heart. Now, the scripture gives a, a couple different uh, times where it says that 1 Samuel, you don't need to turn there, but 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, and Acts 13, verse 22, both say that David is called a man after God's own heart. And you may be thinking, okay, I'm going to go through some scriptures and talk about how awesome he was and the things he did, and, and, but I'm actually not. I'm actually going to go and talk about his failure and how his failure, his sin, uh, while the Lord was gracious to forgive him, there was also cause and effect. There was also consequences of those sins. But despite that, David was still called a man after God's own heart, which should give us confidence and encouragement that no matter how we have failed in the past, that God is faithful. And despite what uh, we may have done, what our past looks like, the Lord is faithful, that he will forgive us and can put us back on that road again. So we're going to start with uh, first, actually, Second Samuel chapter 11, if you would turn your Bibles there. This is a, a passage probably pretty well known. And if you think about it, at this time, David... Uh, had been secure. He's in his place as secure as the kingdom now. He's kind of defeated most of his enemies around him. Uh, the kingdom, uh, his rule is established. And, uh, and I think probably at this point in his life, he's kind of point where he's almost feeling like, you know, I can kind of kick back. I might have a, a little bit of an entitlement um, complex kind of look, you know, I deserve this, you know, I am the king. And actually, he, as king, you know, it's not like he had a divided government with a legislative branch and a Supreme Court. He was the ultimate authority. So he answered to no one except the Lord. So we're going to start this familiar passage about David and Bathsheba. And we're going to just see what we can learn from this. Okay, chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, In the spring, at the time when the kings go out to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. Now they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So that's kind of one of the first problems that comes up, is that it's the time in the spring when kings go out to war. Well, David didn't go out to war. He stayed in Jerusalem. He, uh, again, just kind of kicked back, sent Joab and the army out, but he himself did not go. So it says, verse 2, One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Now from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, by the way, this is an R-rated message this morning. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. Now she came to him, and he slept with her. Now she had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. Now the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent the word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. Now when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace 
and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the master's servants, and he did not go down to his house. So when David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Why haven't you come? Haven't you come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David sent to him, Stay one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line for the fighting is the most fierce. Withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's armies fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Now Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, Now when you have finished giving the kings this account of the battle, now the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they would shoot arrows from the walls? Who killed Abimelech? Some of Jerobetha. Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? Now, if he asks you this, say, say to him, also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Now, the messenger sent out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had said to him. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servant from the wall, and some of your king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. Now when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead and she mourned for him, after that time of mourning was over, David had, brought to, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore his son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So as you can see from this story, what happened, very obviously, that after the sin of adultery that David had committed, he basically tried to cover it up. You know, he brought Uriah home so that he would go with his wife, and they'd think, you know, that the child was his rather than David's. When that didn't work, and that just shows the... Uh, integrity of Uriah. In fact, if you think about it, Uriah the Hittite, he wasn't just a, you know, an ordinary soldier. He was actually one of David's mighty men. You know, in, in second, you don't have to look this up, but 2 Samuel 23, verse 39, and 1 Chronicles eleven forty one, both talk about Uriah being one of David's mighty men. And so he tried to cover it up. When that didn't work, he obviously sent a letter to Joab, basically you might say, do a contract killing. We'll just have him up, withdraw from him so that he dies in battle. And that way, you know, David could probably figure that wasn't me. It was, you know, it was the Ammonites who did this. So David broke, of the Ten Commandments, he broke number 10, coveting, number 7, adultery, 
And number six, murder. So let's pick it up in chapter 12. And we're going to talk about Nathan. Nathan is prophet. It's, it's actually David's prophet. And we're going to look at the first 14 verses. We're going to stop there for a while. It says, The Lord said to Nathan, The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. Now he raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, his drink, and drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Verse 5, David burned with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Judah and Israel, and all of this had been too little. I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with your sword and took his life and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who's close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken your sin away. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have made The enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. So David is confronted by Nathan. Nathan brings the word basically saying, you are the man. You're the one who did this. Now put your finger there. We're going to go to uh, a couple Psalms. Psalms 51. That's a, a song that was written at this time that David wrote, because that's one thing about David, he was, he, when confronted, he did repent. We're going to look at the first 12 verses of Psalm 51. Again, if you have a subtitle on your, under your Psalm 51, it probably says something like this, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. It says, have mercy, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you proved right when you speak and, and justify when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inner 
place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You can read the rest of the psalm. I will focus a little bit on on verse 17. It says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. So at this point, David had a broken and a contrite spirit. And the Lord was faithful to forgive him. But at the same time, there was consequences as a result. There was cause and effect that would affect David the rest of his life. Now, another psalm he written after this was Psalm 32. If you want to flip over there, just want to read the uh, first five verses. And it says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Now when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not cover up And you did not cover up my iniquities. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to forgive. Lord, no matter what our past holds, you are faithful. All right, let's go back to 2 Samuel. We're going to pick it up in verse 15. It says, After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. Now the elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground But he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. Now on the seventh day, the child died. Now David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground, and he washed, he put on lotion, and he changed his clothes. He went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. Now his servants asked him, why are you acting like this? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that he is child is dead, you get up and you eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not go to me. 
So it kind of confounded the, the elders because he was fasting and he would not respond. And while the child was alive, and then when the child died, they thought, well, he may harm himself. And yet David knew what the word of the Lord was, but he said, perhaps the Lord will turn and have mercy and grace upon him. And then with the final statement that he will not return to me, but I will go to him. So their eternity in view. Now, I want us to go to chapter 15. Because what happened was, as the story goes on, and you can read through the, the following chapters, but, but uh, Joab begins, he, he does defeat, takes the city, you know, the enemies are defeated. And then as we go to chapter 15, we, it's on the sub, subtitle is Absalom's Conspiracy. And what happens was, as, as that prophetic would, was that Absalom, who is one of David's sons, began to undermine David because he wants to take over the kingdom for himself. And so he begins to uh, maneuver and uh, do things to manipulate people to get them to his side. Uh, he eventually raises an army to actually go and take, uh, take the kingdom from David and to give it to himself. And, that, and that's basically what chapter 15 is talking about. Now, there's one verse I just want to hold up, just for your remembrance. We'll come back to this. But it says, so what happened was that David had to flee because Absalom's marching with his army into Jerusalem. And so the king and his men have to flee. They leave. And then in verse 16, it says, the king set out with his entire household following him. But he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him, and they hauled it at a place some distance away. So he, he left ten concubines, and concubines are basically wives of a lower stature. They don't, don't have the same uh, stature as a full wife would. But just kind of keep that in mind. He left them there to take care of the, of the palace. Now we're going to go over to chapter 16, and we're going to see the word of the Lord fulfilled. And we're just going to look at actually just two verses. Chapter 16, verses 20 and 22. So this is after Absalom has come into Jerusalem. David and his men have fled. And he's asking uh, one of, actually used to be one of David's advisors what he should do. Should he follow immediately after David? And Absalom, verse 20, said to Athipol, give us your advice. What shall we do? Now Athipol answered, lie with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench in your father's nostrils, and the hand of everyone with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So the word of the Lord was fulfilled. The thing that David had done in secret was again done during the light, during daytime, with all of Israel knowing about it. You know, and you don't need to turn there, but First or First Corinthians chapter ten six says that to paraphrase it says, the things of the Old Testament they happen as examples to keep us from craving evil things. Now, if you think about it, David's sons, he lost three sons. He lost Ammon, he lost Absalom, and he lost. Adjaniah all died by the sword. And to finish that story, what happened was as, as Absalom and his army went after David, there was a battle. Uh, David's forces won. Uh, Absalom was killed. And eventually the kingdom was restored, restored to David. So when David was confronted with this sin, he, you know, he repented. He had a broken heart, a broken, a contrite spirit. And the Lord was faithful to forgive him. 
But again, there was consequences of the sin. There's consequences of the iniquities that followed him on. But he was still called a man after God's own heart. So that should be, again, an encouragement to us. No matter what our past told or what's happened to us in the past, God can use us. Each of us can be a man or a woman after God's own heart. And I was, as I was doing this, this met, you know, figuring why, why was I even doing this message, I feel like it's really for just for one person. I don't know if somebody here today, I don't know if somebody's going to be listening online, but I really felt like it was for one person and everybody else. You know, the, the word of the Lord doesn't return void. So for the rest of you guys, just, you know, take, take what you get out of that. But one thing we, we need to remember is that when we fail, when we fall, when something happens, maybe I'm not talking about the, the degree of David, but we always should run to the Lord and not away from the Lord. Because we all have in our natural tendency, when something like that happens and we fail, our first response is, I, don't, I want to get away. I want to hide. Kind of like, you know, Adam and Eve, we want to, we want to hide rather than running to the Lord. So even in the midst of our failure, we need to turn right around, confess our sins, and run towards the Lord. Repent quickly, and again, the Lord is faithful to forgive. But you know, many times the hardest person for us to forgive is ourself. Many people are carrying around guilt from things of their past that is holding them back. And it's time to let that go. It's time to cut that off, not let it hold you back. And the statement that I, I felt like I heard the Lord say this morning was, you have not been disqualified. You have not been disqualified. Because many times we think back, how could God use me? After what I've done, what's happened in the past, but the Lord is faithful. If we will run to him, if we are asked for forgiveness, he is faithful. So I just want to encourage you this morning, remember that we, regardless of our past, that we can be a man and a woman after God's own heart. God is faithful. God is faithful. All right. What we're going to do now, we're going to have one song, but before we do that, we're going to have a time of a ministry, so no one's prepared for this, but Scott, come on up here. We're going to do a little work. God's always faithful. You know, we sang earlier about that one song about God of miracles and about uh, God's revival coming and... and uh, Nancy's, I think, and probably next week we'll be sharing that Nancy Shelton had a dream, and I'll wait till next week for you guys here, but I think it'll be encourage you guys about the things that are coming our way, which are some very, I thought, very, very powerful things. Uh, but the Lord is, is, you know, we're on this cuffs of being in a place where the Lord has been going to be moving I think, I believe, in signs and wonders that, again, as the encroaching darkness gets darker, the light is going to get lighter. More light. More darkness, but more light. And the church will going to start to arise to take its place, to be that mighty army, and to use the authority that's been given us to see miracles. So what we want to do, I'm just going to pray. If Scott gets something, we'll just have a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or prophecy over someone, whatever it might be, or a healing. So let's just prepare ourselves. Just open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. Lord, Holy Spirit, we invite you. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We love you. We love you, Lord. We say, come, do what only you can do. Lord, we don't want to lean upon the arm of the flesh. Lord, we're looking to you. Lord, that you would stretch forth your hand today. 
this morning, Lord, to touch the sick, Lord, to heal whatever it is, Lord. You are the healer. You are the great physician. Lord, we forget none of your benefits, who forgives all our iniquities and healeth all our diseases. You're the one. So, Lord, we're looking to you.